Hello everyone and welcome to Lawrence Plays Factorio Angel Bobs. Now this is going to be something slightly different. Because I'm aware that Factorio is a relatively slow game to get started, uh, there's lots of sort of manual faffing around at the beginning that doesn't, but before it starts to get particularly interesting, I thought I'd provide a, a summary video of the first 10 episodes just to allow um, anyone who's new to the channel to sort of get stuck in where it becomes a bit more exciting and a bit more a bit more interesting without having felt like they've missed the entire opening part of the of the game. So we started off here with this nice um, starter area with some resources available and of course the first thing you need to do in Factorio is get some iron pr um, production going. Now in, in Angel Bobs it's a, a little bit different to um, vanilla Factorio because as well as digging the ore out of the ground you have to crush it before you can put it into the into the furnace to smelt it. So I've got a setup down here doing that and I'm also grabbing coal up from the top here as well as you can see and I'm using the long reach mod because it makes things so much easier um, and I've played enough in the sort of the early stages of the game that I just don't really want to deal with the running back and forth because uh, it just makes things take even longer. So now the what I'm working on here is getting multiple miners and um, furnaces uh, built up around a single crusher because the crushers are quite a lot faster and then getting the as soon as possible I want to get the coal mining automated and the copper mining automated and basically just get everything so it's so I, I don't have to dig stuff out of the ground by hand anymore that's that's the very much the first stage of automation and having played Factorio before I know that the iron tends to be under much higher pressure than the copper especially at the beginning when you're making the miners and the um, well, the miners and the belts and things, and those all require enormous quantities of iron. But copper is only really required for um, for circuits at this point, so it's it's not really needed needed just yet. That said, I'm going to need some of it, so I'm uh, setting up a bit of a bit of a mining station over here. It's the same basic design as the as the iron mine, but um, I'm going to I'm going to keep it on a slightly smaller scale because I don't need quite the same volume. I also always find I get through a lot more coal than I expect to, so expanding the coal production is. Uh, something I need to, want to do fairly quickly as well. The next step after that is getting power up and running and that means I need to pull some water out of the lake to turn into steam with a, with a boiler and then use these steam engines to uh, produce electricity from it. And that again just runs off coal so it's nice and easy. I'm going to want to power all of my mines eventually so run the cables across here like that and also have to deal with a large quantity of trees getting through over here. And trees are probably one of the real two enemies in Factorio. Trees and cliffs are the main um, main things that frustrate you at this sort of stage of the game because they just get in the way and make it harder to build a help with. The biters, eh, they're much less of a problem. They can be dealt with with bullets and things. Although to be fair, so can trees. So now I can uh, start thinking about getting research up and running and that'll allow me to find better ways of doing, well, basically everything. So I'll start to develop better belts, better power, better miners and so on and of course the um, automation which is one of the whole one of the uh, big things about this game and electric drills of course are very very useful because they allow you to mine much more quickly and you don't have to run around feeding them iron all the time as well but of course they're a bit more expensive to make now that I've got automation I can start getting the um, these machines to build things for me rather than having to put everything together by hand it's much easier if you've got machines to do it for you and to be honest that is the whole point of the game it's all about automating what you're doing building things up much more quickly and efficiently. So the first things I'm automating are the science packs because you need you need to have lots and lots of those and the um, and, and the circuits and, and the assembly machines for similar reasons you can't build anything without assembly machines. Oh I've been attacked so this was something I knew was going to happen eventually that the biters would notice that what I've been doing and they come down to attack. I was able to fight that one off without too much difficulty but it clearly means I do need to keep an eye on what's going on up there and, and make sure I've got some sort of defences set up. So there we go, I've researched uh, gun turrets and that'll allow me to build up some automated defensive buildings to put up to the uh, up near my mine or basically anywhere I think there's going to be attacks from in order to defend the place. The other thing that makes Angel Bob slightly harder at this stage is that your crusher doesn't just produce um, ore to turn into iron plates or copper plates it also produces crushed stone as well so you need to find a way of getting rid of that and these and the, the um, slightly tricky part of it can be that you don't you need to make sure that only that the right products go into the right places so here I've got an assembly machine and on one side and furnaces on the other and that allows it to be sorted appropriately uh, without having to worry about splitters and filters or anything like that now the turrets are coming under attack but I put some ammunition in them so they're um, they're defending quite nicely 
Two turrets is probably going to be enough for a good while now, I, I hope, as long as I can keep them stocked up with ammunition. But then ammunition is another drain on the on the resources, of course, so quite a lot of iron is probably going to end up going into um, into ammunition for these. But we'll see. For now, it's, for now, those two are coping perfectly well. But another thing I can think of is stone walls, so I've researched those now, and that allows me to... Um, to build up walls to put around the base that give the turrets a bit more of a chance because they slow the biters down nicely. But there are several step process, so we need to take the crushed stone coming out of the crusher, turn it into stone, then smelt it into bricks and then build the bricks into a wall. So we've got quite a few machines here doing that. But now they are, I've got a supply of walls coming out and I can gradually build up a defensive wall in front of the turrets. Having a gap in the wall like this will hopefully funnel the biters towards the turrets so that they'll try and come through there rather than anywhere else, so where both turrets can actually can get bring their guns to bear on them. Now it's time to expand a bit. So the having all of the buildings crammed around the, the um, crushing machine was good to start with. It meant I didn't have to worry about transporting stuff around. But now that I've got a little bit further on, I want to have the um, I want to have more miners fe feeding in onto feeding it. So now we can start using belts, and that allows me to carry the the uh, crush, the the, um, the ore over to be crushed, and then again we've got the same sort of system on the other side of it, building up the uh, building up the iron plates and the walls from the two, from the two products from the uh, from the crushing machine. But now I can have four miners working together, and I could potentially build up some other some more crushers if I wanted to as well. And now I can use the belts to bring the iron down towards the the assembly machines. This is the very start of what's going to be sort of sort of like a, a main bus. The, uh, the idea of a main bus is it allows you to have all of your components in one place, all of your raw materials rather, in one place, so you can just start pulling off them with, with various uh, machines and not have to worry about ha carrying or unloading all the uh, components by hand. So this belt here, eventually once I've got enough belts, is going to bring the, the iron down to, be, to fill up all these assembly machines. However, at this point, I don't really have enough iron being produced in order to keep them all fully satisfied. So it's it's a gradual process, but at the moment it's working it's working reasonably well. It's providing iron for the science uh, science potion development, which is the which is the first stage. I hear I'm building up some some dragon's teeth round the round the, the the gap in the wall. The idea of these is that it will slow the biters down a bit as they're trying to get in. Um, and if they do attack anything, hopefully they'll attack the uh, the dragon's teeth and the walls rather than getting through to, all the way through to the turrets. It does seem to work quite well, but it does require a bit more wall and a bit more assembly time and uh, manual building time at this stage than it would to have it all um, just just as a uh, long line of turrets. Now I've got almost enough belts to bring a uh, supply of coal down to the boilers. And what that's this is quite important because if you run out of electricity, the whole mine shuts, the whole factory shuts down. And if you're using electric miners, then your coal production can shut down as well. And that sort of causes a sort of a rolling blackout and eventually can, can bring the entire factory to, to its knees because you don't have anything producing the coal for it. Next up is to upgrade the, the miners on the, on the coal mine to electric miners, which are significantly faster and more effective. And you don't have to keep running up to refill them with coal either. So it makes it much more sort of just place them and forget about it, at least while the coal mine still has enough, um, enough coal in it. And I can then run down here and feed the boilers with a, a burner inserter. And the advantage of a burner inserter is it doesn't require electricity. So as long as there's coal in front of it, it'll keep feeding the boilers and keep them keep them occupied, keep them running. And that makes it a bit easier to recover if you do get a complete sort of power failure and have to try and recover from scratch. Now we see we're finally producing enough iron for the um, for the demands. So I've got plenty of belts, plenty of science potions. And now I can start building up the assembly machines and the, and the inserters and things, and, and doing all of that automatically rather than having to build them all by hand. And whilst it is technically slower to build things by hand than it is to build them automatically, the fact that you can have lots and lots of assembly machines doing it at the same time makes it much, much quicker. And now I'm trying to expand out the the uh, iron production, so we're, these these crushers can, can be built up to allow for more uh, more crushers. But now we've got the um, now we've got the crushed stone and the crushed sapphire coming out on the same on the same belt so we need to have a splitter in here to do the sorting and after that it's 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 a case of doing much the same thing again we turn the crushed stone into stone and then into walls to get mostly at this point to get rid of it to be honest because i don't really it's a byproduct from what i actually want then we can run some coal over from this belt and put that onto the same belt as the as the crushed um sapphire and that means i'll have both both of the ingredients i need for a for a furnace on the same belt and the big advantage of that is you can then just run it along there, have a load of furnaces next to it, and they'll all keep, and it'll keep everything running. And you can start again, start producing iron on a larger scale. So this sort of, at this sort of time of the game, there are two things you're working on. One is just trying to make everything work at a faster rate, 
and the other is trying to produce um, the other is trying to do the research to get better thing bigger and better systems and now I'm moving everything down onto a main bus hopefully I've got enough things in my inventory now to, to start building it up but the idea is we have this bus running down here which will have iron and then copper and bricks and stone and wood and all of the other ingredients I need and then all of that can be fed in to the middle uh, to, off to the side sorry where all of these assembly machines are and you have all of the things being built off to the side of the bus so all the resources are always available and it's nice and easy to grab them. This is a fairly standard way of playing Factorio I have to admit um, but it works very well and it's um, so I didn't really feel any need to change away from a thing that just works to be honest. My original plan here was to have four was to leave space for four belts of iron then four belts of copper and then put other less used resources onto um, other belts next to them and that's sort of pretty much a habit from playing vanilla factorio but in angel bobs you actually don't get through as much of the basic resources as you as i was used to um it make, more than makes up for that by having far more complicated resources that you need to deal with as well but the initial stages are much much simpler so this was serious overkill but i left it like that for a while you also get much much faster belts later on as well so with a bit of research i can produce belts that will make things but they will transport things around at three, four, five, six times the speed. And so I don't need to worry quite so much about having as many separate belts for the resources. Here we are expanding out the mine, the, uh, the smelting again, so I can make significantly more iron because that's, at this stage of the game, is the main thing I need. That said, though, my factory down here seems to be running quite well. If it's missing anything, it's missing copper for the, uh, what's that making? Uh, for, the, for the wire construction over there. Another thing to worry about is how to um, how to produce wood in sufficient quantities. So in Vanilla Factorio, you don't need, really need a great deal of wood. You can uh, you use it for the basic power poles and possibly for fuel, and that's about it. But in Angel Bobs, it's used to make the basic level of some of the belt parts. I think it's the so this, yeah I think it's the splitters, and also the basic level of the circuit boards. So you need to have quite a lot of it running through your factory in order to to produce all of that, or, or, or enough of it as a resource. So it's not really practical to get it by chopping down trees. Yes, you get a lot of wood from chopping them down, but it's not really, you can't really automate that in quite the same way you can everything else. So there are various ways of growing uh, growing wood in, in, uh, in um, Angel Bobs. And the one I'm doing here is Bob's Greenhouses, which is, to be honest, it's not the best way because it's a bit too simple and a lot of people reckon it's kind of cheating and shouldn't be shouldn't still be in there but um, I didn't realize this at the time so I've gone for it anyway <laughs> um, yeah so but that requires glass to make the the greenhouses which makes a certain amount of sense and that requires me to dig up some of this bobmonium and get the silicon out of it and turn that into the glass so here we go I've got the uh, I've got it I've got it being crushed producing the uh, the, the silicon ore and the tin ore which I, I just don't need at the moment um, but the silicon ore I can then chuck into and I need to build a sorting facility for this so we dig up the bobmonium, crush it, and then sort it, and that, and that will produce the the, uh, the two different products that I need. And because I don't need a great deal of it at the moment, I'm happy to just shove it all into a box for now. It's um, easy enough. And then we can start smelting it into glass like this, and then build up some greenhouses. Now, of course, greenhouses require water, so I'm building that over here by the uh, by the lake. And the tr so the trees grow in the greenhouse, and then you can use the assembly machine to turn the the trees back into into seeds or into saplings to make new trees. Fortunately, doing that, running through that process produces significantly more wood than you actually need for um, making the making the extra saplings. So it's it's a sort of very net positive process. However, I then discovered that trees actually grow quite slowly, so I'm going to need more greenhouses than I expected. So here we go, building up some um, extra greenhouses and feeding some saplings around into them. So these greenhouses will now grow the um, grow the wood for me, and I can then use the belt to transport it out and, and take it onto the bus. As ever, iron is always a shortage, so I build up some more miners to get a bit more of the ore out for making them making it. And all these electric miners um, are putting quite a strain on my electricity network, so let's put in some more generation as well. Now that the wood is flowing nicely, the next step is to perform similar sort of tasks on the copper supply so I can get a decent a decent flow of copper coming into onto the bus as well. So that means upgrading to the electric mining drills, which are um, a bit more expensive and I've run out of copper to build them, but yeah, you never know, you know, you know, what can you do? Three of those should be enough though for now. We can now put together some, <clears throat> some crushers for those as well. And it's a similar idea to what I had before. So we're going to split the crushed stone off and just put it in a box for now and we can deal with that manually because we don't, 
because we don't really have much else to do with this at the moment. Unfortunately, there's this cliff in the way, and um, as I said, the second biggest enemy, or the biggest enemy in Factorio, is the cliffs at this stage of the game, certainly, because you just can't get past them. They um, block the way up like this, and uh, you have to end up you end up having to go around them or doing sort of weird things to get past. Now we're adding coal onto the bus because we're going to need that down here for the for, the, for smelting the copper, and we're doing exactly the same things we did before. Um, Stereotype? No, saf stereotype ore. This oh, I don't know. What is the sa sapphire and stereotype? And I still can't remember which is which. We have the ore on one side of the belt, coal on the other side of the belt, and then we can smelt from there. And having the belt running upwards like this means that I c if I want to, I can extend the belt further downwards in order to get more smelting onto the same one if I need to. And here, what we're doing here is putting a split in the um, in the belt, so uh, that allows the belt to feed both up and down, so the bu it can go both ways on the bus. And that means I can get my uh, finally get the copper up to going around to the, the the wire production facility at the top here. I'll also split that off here to allow me to get the stone through, which I'm going to need for underground belts. And there we go. That's the uh, the three different types of basic belt are uh, now being produced. So I'll move the science down a bit further out of the way to allow for other things to be done as well. And now, and because I need copper for producing the science packs, I'm going to um, bring some of that over. So we've got here we've got on this belt, as you can see, we've got half iron, half copper. And that means I can uh, pull both of those in as I need them for the for producing the science packs. Now what I'm doing here is putting the cogs on one side and keeping the copper on the other because that way I can just feed all of the science pack constructors off the um, off the one belt and not have to worry about trying to find trying to faff around and find ways to fit products in from further away. A bit more click tree clearing, and then down here we can put in the um, the science machines uh, of which I currently have just the one. In this stage of the game, you spend a lot of time clearing out the uh, trees because they're just taking up the whole, taking up a lot of space, and you have to do it all manually because you haven't got bots or vehicles to run them over with. But now I can make the um, defences a bit more effective. I can move them, move the turrets up a bit closer to the wall because there's no reason not to have to, no reason to have them all quite so far back because they're not directly guarding the miners anymore so much as just guarding that side of the base. I'm a little bit worried at this point about whether I'm going to have any attacks coming in on different different parts of the base but at the moment they've only really attacked in one place so I'm happy to leave it just defended just defended up there I tend to be at this stage of the game I tend to be rather reactive to the biters rather than proactive which isn't ideal but it's there are too many distractions really but I do want to get the walls up and being constructed automatically because it's a that it's important to have walls put it that way <laughs> and if I've got them in a box down here I can just grab them when I need them now I've realised I'm not getting through the crushed stone quickly enough. There's a lot... I'm using so much iron up that it requires, say, a bit more rather larger facilities to get through all the crushed stone than I, ha than I had at the time. So here we go, building up some more more machines to turn the crushed stone into, into stone and then to smelt it down into bricks that can be turned into walls. Also trying to find a way to wind the, the coal in to get it onto the furnaces so they've got something to cook with. And another stage is to think about putting walls around the base. Now, the walls on them by themselves won't really defend the base properly because the biters can chew their way through them. But it does, at the very least, if you've got a wall completely encircling your base, then you can relax. You can be assured that if the biters do attack, they're not going to be able to get through without you getting an alert about something being destroyed. So at the moment, I'm trying to build up a system to allow me to basically a wall that goes all the way around the edge of the base but I don't want to get too close to the biters because that will alert them and then they'll come running over and attack the wall and I don't want them to, obviously don't want them to do that if, if I can help it oh but there they are fortunately at this stage of the game a little a little biter attack like that is easy enough to deal with with the submachine gun but I can't obviously I can't be there all the time so I don't so um, I'm trying to move the wall a bit further away so they hopefully won't notice it so I'll just keep it down here as, as close to as close into my base as possible. Oh, we've run out of power. Ah, we've run out of power because some biters got in and they started eating the um, the burner inserters that were protected that were feeding those um, boilers. That's a worry. So I need to find out where they were coming from and build up some defences to keep to keep that side of the base protected as well. But first, I should probably finish off the one I was working on on the uh, on the west side. Here we go. Seal up all the little little gaps in the wall in the cliff faces so I can try and get a decent level of protection all the way around the outside of the base. One of the other things that Angel Bob's introduces is the electronics assembly machines. These are significantly smaller and faster than the normal assembly machines, but they have a limited subset of the of the things they can make. So you can only really you can only really use them to make the various types of electronics boards and some of the um, components that will go into them as well, like the um, 
like the copper cable. But when you can use them, they're smaller so they take up less space and are easier to power and wind things in and out of. And they're also faster, so they're um, generally just, just generally more efficient. There we go, that's some basic circuit boards created. So we'll push those over onto the bus as well. And here again we see the sort of the, the fun of trying to deal with the cliff faces and going through various weird and difficult twists and turns to get to get past them on a, at a narrow spot. Because the basic underground belts can only cross two squares um, between the entrance and the exit to them. So they're not very effective. Oh, and the biters have got in again. So it looks like we're going to need some more defences over on that side of the base. We can always put a gun turret in like that. Make some ammunition for it. And then we're a bit better defended, for now. The turrets up at the top seem to be holding up quite well. They're uh, taking, they're getting quite a lot of attacks, but they're dealing with them quite effectively, so I don't think we need to worry about them at the moment. However, they are eating through quite a lot of ammunition, so it might be worth having something to build that ammunition automatically, rather than me having to produce it all by hand. And if we feed the uh, a belt up here that has ammunition on one side and coal on the other, then we can use burner inserters to keep the turrets loaded, and we don't have to worry about running power out to them as well, which, which can be quite useful. It's, it's, it's one less thing to worry about. Burner inserters aren't fast, but they also don't use any power when they're not actually inserting, whereas normal inserters will always always use some power and, and use a bit more when they're not doing anything. Uh, sorry, when they are doing something. So we're getting more attacks down on the um, at the power state, power plant area again now, so because the pollution is starting to spread. So I think it's time to put, extend the wall and put some put some defences over there as well and get some turrets up. Now I've got the ammunition creation automated. It's a bit easier to run ammunition belts out to. To all the fact, all, all the um, all the places where where it's needed, okay, it uses up quite a lot of belts to do so, but it does mean everything gets defended properly. And now I've realised that one one machine making ammunition is not enough for the um, for a base this size, especially when the belts are being expanded as I'm doing at the moment, because that just even just the act of filling all the belts up gets through quite a lot of ammunition. Here we go. The bites are now getting up to the point where they're attack managing to attack the walls, so it's time to put some more turrets in and increase the iron supply again. Okay, the top part of the base is now completely sealed in. We're not completely protected because the bottom side is undefe completely undefended and we don't have very many turrets around the edges, but at least now any, any attacks that come in from the north will have to fight their way through a, a wall before they can get anywhere near the base. So I shouldn't get any more sudden unexpected blackouts from biters eating through the coal supplies or the, inser or the inserters for the, for the um, boilers. Now it's time to place some radars down, and radars allow me to keep an eye on what's going on around my base because they when when you've got radar up you can use the map view and see what's going on nearby without having to actually run over there and have a look yourself and now we'll move the um the, the main bus over to the right a bit rather than going under this cliff there's quite a lot of space over to the right so let's go that way instead next thing to do is to start automating the construction of the assembly machines again we were doing that before um on with one of the much earlier bus prototypes but I've got, and I've got, I've just got fed up of building them by hand. So now, if we, if we build, automate it up like this, then it'll, it should work. And as you can see, I'm still struggling with the, the short underground belts as well. It makes, makes these things a little bit more complicated, but it, it, it's manageable. The next thing to automate is the red science packs, so we can start researching things, things a bit more, in a bit more, in, uh, a bit more in depth. But, but first, we've got a power crisis to worry about. <laughs> There's always something going wrong, and this time it's a shortage of power. So I run back over here, put in another another boiler and some more steam engines, and we should get some more power from it. Here we go. The red product, red science production seems to be going reasonably well. They're dribbling through at a, a slow rate, but it's probably given given that there's only one uh, research machine running at the moment, that's probably sufficient. The next thing that I get through a lot of is the miners. So I want to make that I want to get them automated as well. They're quite simple, it's just a, uh, a cog and, a, and then another assembly machine to make the miners. But not having to do those by hand will make things a bit easier. Again, this is placing quite a heavy load on my um, iron production facilities. So I'm going to try and expand those as well. The sapphirite patch up here has got a reasonable amount of space left on it, so I should be able to fit a decent number of mining drills there. But these crushers seem to be working more or less flat out, so it's about time I, uh, I built some more of those to go, to go in and help feed the a bit more crush sapphirite through for making into the making into iron. Those I am still making by hand though. Just try and create a bit of space for what's going on because it's always it's always very hard to leave enough space in Factorio because you're never quite sure how big something's going to be until you realise that you actually didn't leave enough space for it and, and it's going to be twi take up twice as much room as you thought. But here we go, here's a larger iron smelting area and hopefully that will allow us to keep up with the uh, demands of the base for at least a little while. It's a bit of a squeeze to get all this through sometimes but uh, should be manageable. 
easy if I remember to separate out the crushed stone. And there we go, that should more or less double the iron throughput because we've got six cr six crushers building the, um, producing the uh, crushed iron instead of, uh, the, the appropriate ores instead of just three. And the next question is how to balance them all together so that they're all, so the iron from all of them is being fed in reasonably nicely. To be honest, it doesn't really matter because it's all going to be going to essentially the same place anyway. But this gives me an opportunity to put it in the second belt down the, down the bus and get a bit more iron flowing through. And then every so often you need to make sure it's all being balanced up so the second belt gets pushed across onto the first one. Once again, I'm producing crushed stone faster than I can deal with it, so it's time to expand the, the stone manufacturing facilities a bit. We also need to pull out the crushed stone from the copper smelting facilities because that needs to come up and join in with the rest of the crushed stone. We don't really want it just to just be being fed into a box because, as you saw just now, the box fills up. Now we've researched long-handled inserters, we can start filling these smelters from the other side of the belt, from the other side of the output belt, because they, they, can, they can reach a bit further. And that gives us a bit more flexibility in how we can get these systems set up. And there we go. Now it's chomping through the crushed stone much more quickly and efficiently, and everything should start to run smoothly again. Let's add in some more mining, because you can never have too much mining. another biter attack inside the base. Where did they come from? Oh, that's a mystery. Maybe they came from the... must have come from the, around the south because the north side is completely blocked up and, well, safe. And along here we have to be careful because the two types of... the two ore patches are very close and in fact touching. So we need to make sure the bobmonium ore get... any bobmonium ore that gets dug up is, is split off and put with the with the rest of the bobmonium and doesn't get... doesn't sort of pollute the sapphirite pile. So, as we got attacked, let's put a wall in down here to keep the biters at bay. And then some turrets as well, of course, to uh, to defend the wall. We'll load those manually for now, because bringing the main belt down all this way is going to be a bit of an effort. But let's start building ammunition on the bus. We've got some iron coming in here, so we can pull it all off, turn it into ammunition along here, and feed that up somewhere, and get it back onto that belt we made earlier. And it can carry on just as it did before. Right, now we've got all this ammunition coming up here, I think it's time to improve the defences up here a bit further as well, because we're taking quite a lot of damage on the on the walls and the dragon's teeth, and even maybe a little bit on the turrets as well. So, there's always room for a few more turrets up here, and expanding the dragon's teeth as well. And hopefully that's... Now, and now we've got the um, the ammo belt coming up here, it's much easier to get these turrets loaded, and to keep, the, and to keep them supplied as well. Now, oh, we can kite all the biters back towards the base, and that'll get, uh, get all the ones that were out killed off, but they re unfortunately they then produce them too quickly for me to for me to then be able to get in very easily to go and destroy the base. That said, at this point, it's clearly far too difficult because I've just been horribly killed. Let's try that again with a bit less fail, shall we? Now these are still fairly early biters, so it's, it shouldn't be too difficult to, to kill them. The problem is the um, is is the worms, which are their um, effectively their turrets, and those have a have a fairly sizable range, and I think they. They may, they certainly outrange me, they might outrange my turrets as well. But if I can put a couple of them in like this, using long reach is a bit of a cheat, but it, it does work quite well, and then shove some ammunition in them and start repairing them, they will hopefully be able to take out whatever enemies are there before they get before they get mercilessly destroyed. Unfortunately we're getting now attacked further down as well, so let's go and down and deal with that. And so th this is the problem, you wake up one lot of biters and then some more find their way in, and there's one down there for some strange reason. And so you end up just sort of dotting turrets all the way around the edge of the base, just in, in order to keep the um, the nests you do find at bay. Now these ones are much smaller, so they should be. There's only a couple of nests here, and they don't have any worms, so those are much easier to deal with. But there's still that worry about the one up at the top. That's much much harder to deal with because of the worm the, or the worms it had. Now it's only got one left, but even so, they're still still quite dangerous. But again, with um, using long reach to drop it in far too close, and then using a repair pack from a distance to keep it uh, keep it repaired, works pretty well. It feels a bit cheap and cheesy, but it but it does work quite nicely. So now I'm thinking about where else to put some walls in around the edge of the base, and to sort of to claim off a larger area of territory, because I know I'm going to need to build up more more area fairly soon in order to well just to maintain to, to carry on expanding my factory. And so a wall across there that that seals off the top quite nicely. That means I don't need this wall anymore. But of course I do need to then worry about arming that wall. And putting these ghosts down like this is quite handy because it means you can you can drop turrets in every so often, but know that you've left exactly the right amount of space 
to fill it up completely with turrets in the future if you need to. The only risk is that if you then come along with um, ro roboports later, you might accidentally end up filling all of these in even though you didn't really mean to. But at the moment, it's quite an easy way of, of, keep, of, of, get, of making sure you space your turrets properly. In order to keep my research running at a reasonable speed, it's time to put some more science labs in, I think. Because the more of those you've got, the faster the research will run, and therefore the quicker you can get the things you need. And now running a... I know I said, just said this is a bit of an effort, but I don't like having turrets that aren't being supplied with ammunition, because it just means you risk ending up with them not being able to defend themselves, or running out of ammunition and then just getting overwhelmed by any attacks that come in. So along here we'll put in some turrets, and I put, I'm doubling them up in, in choke points, like at the end of the wall, where I'm expecting to get attacked a bit more. Now I've developed landfill, so I can expand the land out a bit to get around little awkward little corners like that. And that'll allow the ammunition to flow all the way down again. These little attacks will keep coming in, but they're fairly easy to thwart, so I'm not too worried about them at the moment. But we'll see how they go as, as time passes. Expanding out the copper production a bit, because there wasn't enough coming through. And now grenades, the, um, the best way of clearing the forest out. <laughs> By far the easiest way. Unfortunately, at this stage of the game, I'm having to double tap the, with the grenades because the grenades aren't yet powerful enough to take out a tree all by the, in a single shot. So, a bit more research into uh, grenades may be required. I can also pull out this wall down here now because I don't need it anymore because I've built the wall across the top. I spent a lot of time clearing trees at the beginning of this game. It was ridiculous. Now, because I'm playing Angel Bobs, it's time to go for something a bit different. Let's start mining some Jeeva Light and see what we can do with that. The plan here is that this will be an easy way of getting both iron and copper in from the same mine. It should make things much more easy and, um, and efficient. As long as we can keep them, the amount being used reasonably balanced. <laughs> That's the, um, the tricky thing with anything that produces multiple outputs. In vanilla, the only thing you have to worry about that with is oil and the oil supplies. But in, in Angel Bobs, almost everything produces multiple outputs. You've seen earlier with the crushed stone and the crushed ore how much effort I had to go to to deal with those. The same sort of thing is true with Jeeva Light and many of the more advanced processing um, methods. So Jeeva Light processing is a little bit more involved than um, the basic processing. Once, it's, once these ores have been crushed in the, uh, in the crushers, as usual, we then need to feed them into a sorter, which will rummage through and pick out the, the bits of the different types of iron and copper ore and allow me to convert those into iron and copper or possibly even steel further down the, uh, further down the chain. And once again, the crushed stone has to be filtered out and passed over to these belts over here, which will take it up to be turned into bricks and walls and so on. And here we go, here comes the Jeeva light. And as before with the crushed stone, we can now use splitters to sort the different ores that are coming out of it. So we've got three things coming out of here. There's the iron ore, the copper ore and the slag. The iron ore and copper ore can both be smelted into useful products and the slag can be crushed and then sent, sent to join the endless belt of crushed stone. We're also going to need uh, coal, of course, in order to run the the, the smelting facilities that's coming off here. So as usual, we're doing the half on one side of the belt, half one product on one side of the belt, the other on the other side, and that, and uh, then we can run furnaces from it. And for now, let's just shove the the slag into a box and worry about it a bit later because it's um yeah no nope, here we go here's the, there we go it's already a bit later so we're going to push this through a um a crushing machine and feed it onto the crushed stone belt. That's fairly easy. Next up, we have furnaces, and in exactly the same way as over on the um. On the other refineries, just run um, run a big long line of them on either side of the belt, plus belts to take the raw products in and the finished products out. And we're getting attacked again. That's weird because I'm sure I um, I put a wall around this whole area, and so it should be should be completely protected. What went wrong there? Maybe we'll find out. Maybe it came from. So yeah, maybe if we put a wall all the way across the bottom here, this won't happen again. Guess we'll have to try that and see what happens. It's a lot of wall, but I've got a lot of crushed stone to make into it, so I can probably manage that. Building through forests is always a bit tricky because there's so many trees in the way. You have to go through. You basically have to go through multiple times. First time to sweep out all of the trees, and then back again to put the wall in. And if you can't draw in a straight line with a mouse, then it makes it even harder. Another attack. That's very weird because I've been essentially, essentially guarding the bottom part of the base because I've been building down there. Let's get that sorted out and rebuild. At this point, I was very confused as to where all these attacks were coming from. So check the walls. Oh. And there we go, there was a tiny little base over here that had uh, somehow escaped my attention. So we'll drop a turret into the middle of it and quickly slaughter it. At this point I started to wonder if it was worth finishing the wall across the bottom. I think I got a bit distracted and um, went back to building my Jeeva Light processing facility here, which was really expensive in, in uh, inserters. And at this point I didn't really have them... I didn't, I, in fact I don't think I had them automated at all, I was building them all by hand. So this took quite a while to, uh, to build all of this stuff up. 
But then once I did and repaired the damage the bikes had done, it started to output the iron and the copper, just as I was, I was hoping. But it wasn't really pulling it through quickly enough. The sorter was running at maximum capacity. So that meant, all you, what can you do at that point? You just have to put more, um, more capacity so you, can, so you can push through more, more product. And at some point, grabbing bricks off the bus gets a bit frustrating. So here we are, I set up a, um, a thing to pull, the, pull half of them off and shove them in a box so I could just run over and grab them easily. And now we've got a full grey belt of output coming from the uh, crushers, which means at the moment that's as much as I can possibly get through there without putting more belts in. <clears throat> and that's still not quite keeping up on the iron production down here. So let's put some more crushers in and have another belt. And if we feed that into the other side of the splitter like this, then we have the advantage of being able to have two, be two potentially two full belts going in and a full belt of Jeeva light coming out on one side and a bit less than a belt of the crushed stone coming out on the other side because the proportions aren't one to one. Unfortunately we now seem to be backing up the um, the slag processing so let's put some more crushers in for that as well and that's even now even more of this crushed stone being pushed through um, but we seem to be coping quite well with that at the moment it's not um, it's not backing up at all yet so that seems to be all right. Add in another sorter to keep everything balanced and now try and get the um, output of the crushed stone for the stone crushing to be balanced as well so we get a decent amount of flow on both sides of the belt. But, and we're going to start needing pipes I think so building pipes especially underground pipes by hand takes forever and is a real pain so I'm going to automate that as well. I've got quite a lot of spare space over here to the left so I think it's time to start thinking about steel next and also making grenades on the bus as well because I get through a lot of those clearing trees out and they're very useful for it. So now if we want to get hydrogen and oxygen out of water we need to do that we need to get the water for that so that means a pump over here with this really long underground pipe to carry it all the way back again and now we have this machine electrolyzing water into um, hydrogen and oxygen but it also outputs um, slag as well so we're going to need to feed that back in up here but fortunately we already have a system for, for dealing with the slag so we can just pass that up here through here and add it on to the rest of it easy we can now do the usual trick of running coal and iron on the same belt and with a chemical furnace we can turn that into steel with a, once we have a supply of oxygen. The only slight problem we have is that um, we also need to get rid of this hydrogen somehow. Um, we can work, whack in a couple of tanks for now, that'll, that'll uh, look after it for the time being. And some tank on the oxygen as well so we can just keep, keep an eye on how much is being produced and how much is being used and work out when we start to run out of it as well. Now I've developed flare stacks so we can stick one of those in as well. Unfortunately, they require steel to make, if I remember correctly. So, but let's get steel onto the bus anyway, so avoiding these cliff edges. And down over here, we can join it in with all the rest of the products that I'm using at the moment. Okay, it's being produced quite slowly at the moment, but it, it's a start, right? Of course, the answer to it being made too slowly is to put in more, more machines to make it faster. Easy. And maybe some more tanks to hold the gases we can't get rid of yet, because we can't, still can't afford to build a flare stack. Now, the next challenge is going to be to build the basic electronics boards and these are different from basic circuit boards because they have electronics components on them and they're required by different different machines so that makes it a bit more difficult we're going to start requiring things like solder which is made from lead and resin from trees as well I think so that means I'm going to need to start worrying about the bobmonium patch up in the north and have something useful coming off that and once again my crushed stone processing isn't going quickly enough so I'm going to need to put some more of these processing facilities in there we go, that can keep up with the full belt that seems to be running into it at the moment. Now we need to do something with all this copper, <coughs> like get it onto the bus, because at the moment it's causing a bit of a backup in the um, Jeeva light processing facilities. If, there's, if you're producing more copper than you are producing iron, then there's nowhere for the iron to go, or rather there's nowhere for the copper to go to get out of the way of the excess iron that's coming in, excess iron ore that's coming through, if that makes sense. So if we feed this onto the main bus, then hopefully that will allow us to get through it quick, reasonably quickly. So now with the uh, bobmonium processing, there are quite a few different things coming out of the bobmonium, so we need to filter them all off independently so we know we can do sensible things with them. And since we're not using silicon at the moment, I'm just going to shove it all in a silo here to get rid of it, um, or at least to get it out of out of sight, out of mind, because all I, I don't want it at the moment. All I want is the, the tin that's coming out of that, or is it lead? No, it's tin from this one. It's coming out of that processing facility. 
And so we'll set up the usual smelting system down here, where we run coal in from a convenient belt. And we can then output tin, and that can be put onto the bus in the usual way, when we find a nice convenient place to do so. And that can run through. And I don't think I'm going to need tin in particularly enormous amounts for a good while, so that relatively small uh, processing facility should be, should be sufficient. And again, we can crush the slag that comes out and pass that over and put it onto the, onto the, into the processing area up there as normal. Now as I'm starting to actually use the bobmonium, I'm going to need to have a slightly, better, slightly more mines for it, pull up a bit more of it out of the ground, just to keep, the system, keep it ticking through. And there we go, the um, silicon's being unloaded into that. Oh, but of course I didn't notice the um, sapphire, so that needs to be uh, filtered out as well, <laughs> just not in order to keep bobmonium flowing. And there we go. As long as we don't get too much sapphire coming out here, then it should then it'll be absolutely fine, and it will just filter it out neatly and chuck it onto the other belt. Now it's starting to look like we're not getting coal out quickly enough as well, because the, the st we're starting to starve the power generation at the bottom, and that's really bad. If the power generation browns out, then you end up with nothing happening, uh, in, in, and you can't get the. If you, you run out of power, your 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 drills stop running because they're all electric as well, so you just have a complete nut of brown out, and you're completely stuffed. Now I've got steel though, I can move on to making the Mark II um, boilers and steam engines. Now I don't think that they're that much better. They're more compact, yes, because they you get twice the performance, or at least more performance in the same space. But they still use just as much coal, so you can't use it as a as a sort of an emergence, as a way of getting a slightly more efficient power generation. But it does make it a bit more space efficient. But we still need to make sure we've got enough coal coming through. And up here we've got the starting coal patch, for some reason, has this little strip of rubite around the edge of it. So that gives you an extra challenge where you need to start filtering it on the way through in order to take out the rubite, which you don't want at all at this point. I mean, it's it's not needed when you when you're at the sort of the, the producing coal and uh, producing copper and iron stage. You don't you don't need to make lead from it as well. But it's getting to the point where I'm starting to think I should perhaps process some of it. And as usual, we need to split out the crushed stone. And otherwise, the rubite can be then fed into some smelting machines to make lead. A little bit of tweaking of the ammunition production here. So because there's because the biters are getting through and able to damage the wall, that clearly means it's time to add in a bit more a bit more defensive cover in that sort of, in that sort of general area. And let's put both the um, use both sides of the belt with these bricks. And finally, we feed the crushed stone in here, and the lead production is finished. I've got so much lead used, um, so much. I've got so much brick stored up at this point, and that it's starting to back up. So there's you can get through a fair amount of it fairly quickly by just paving large chunks of the base. But of course, if you um, just try and grab it off the off the belt, it comes in very very slowly. So let's go back to putting it into a box again. Okay, so the next project is to start building up the basic electronic circuits. So those are the ones which, as I said, have the um, components on them. So they are basic circuits, basic electrical circuits plus electronics components. Of it. So basic circuit boards plus electronics components makes basic electronics boards. And again, these can be done in the, um, in the electronics assembly machines uh, because they count as part of electronic circuits because, well, they are. So I'll, I'll build up some machines here to knock a few of those together because it's quicker than building them by hand. And one of the things we need for them is coal, so let's bring some coal down here. And I'm also going to need wood, I think, so let's add that onto the bus as well. Ha, I picked up enough bricks now that um, I can do a bit more a bit more um, flooring in the base. And the nice thing about having bricks down everywhere is when you're running on them, you move a bit quicker as well. So getting a lot of the base bricked up is actually quite useful for, for, speed, for movement speed. Now, let's start making those circuit boards, electronics boards. And the next thing they require is steam, so if I bring some water over and plug it into a boiler, fortunately I've already got a supply of coal here, so that makes that this nice and easy to put together. We can get some steam blowing out the top of it. Then we start making the actual components themselves. This requires tin and copper to make the tinned wire, and then carbon to make the resistors. We then need one of these blue furnaces to start making solder out of lead and, I think, tin. And then when we add rosin to that as well, we can make tinned cables, I think those are. No, is that, no that's solder. Oh, I'm not sure, to be honest. <laughs> and we then need to combine all of those with the normal circuit boards, and that will create the slightly more advanced ones, the electronics boards. Here we go, let's see if it works. And there we go. Electronics boards coming out. And I only made one mistake, and that was putting a long-handled inserter in somewhere that should have been a short one. So my cunning plan here was to combine them onto a belt with the circuit boards, so, so I can feed both of them into any build I need, and I don't need to worry about which one it requires. This, I mean, 
it's sort of, it works okay. Um, 20 episodes, 20, 25 episodes later, I'm not sure it was the best way to do it, but eh, it's working all right. It's not, it's not caused any serious problems. It's just a little bit fiddly sometimes. In the background here. Now I've got those circuit boards, I can build a flare stack, and that means I can get rid of some of this spare hydrogen I've been generating over all this time. And that means the steel production can kick back in again, which is a relief. That's what I was building circuit boards for, after all. And now my oxygen production isn't fast enough, so we can easily enough add in a bit of um, extra input in the form of the second electrolyzer. And then some more um, chemical furnaces as well to build the, the actual steel itself. Right, it's time to redo the, the belt construction facility I had before. Make it a bit better, um, because the one at the top was a bit rubbish, really. It didn't really... Um, it was a bit too tangled, and it didn't leave any space for expansion and so on, and getting the some of the extra, more interesting belt types is a bit of a mission as well. So what I'm doing here is I'm also upgrading to yellow, to building yellow belts as well. Those And that will allow me to make significantly faster belts than the places where I need them. But at this point, I'm probably still going to stick with the grey belts for a lot of the stuff I'm doing, because they're just so much cheaper. The... Uh, the yellow belts, as you can see, also require some more exotic materials like tin and possibly steel. No, no steel yet, but they seem to—they are significantly more complicated and use a lot more parts. And I'm having a bit of trouble with the design here as well, <laughs> with the underground belts in particular. I mean, with the splitters in particular. The underground belts, as you can see, they're they're running quite happily. A bit of time to empty some of the rubbish out of my inventory. And as you can see here, I've also combined the stone and the brick belts because it seems like, it's, well, mostly because it seemed like a good idea at the time. And here we have a weird tangle to get around those cliff faces. And if I do this, then I can combine the, what have we got here? The stone and the wood onto a single belt, because I need that for underground belts. And then a bit of tidying up to uh, to neaten up the belt, uh, the bus, so I have all my all my elements at the bottom here. I'm investigating the yellow bit underground belts now. So the nice thing is yellow belts are much, much faster than grey belts. I think they're twice as fast. And their undergr the underground belts will go further as well. I think it's six squares for yellow ones versus two squares for grey ones. So it's, it's a big improvement, and it means it makes it a lot easier to jump over uh, cliff faces, anything else you've been building, just anything that's in the way. Now over here, I've realised that the hydrogen isn't getting vented properly, and it turned out it's because I got the filter, the um, the overflow valve, the wrong way round. Uh, they're rather hard to tell, especially which way round they are, especially when they're hidden behind a a great big tank as well. But eh, it's fixed now. If you're ever in doubt what to do next in Factorio, the answer is almost always work on the next science pack. So I finished getting the, the belts that I wanted, so now rather than umming and erring about what, what random things to go for next, obviously the next thing to do is to go for the next science pack. And because I've been starting to, been struggling a little bit with the dealing with the aliens, the next science pack is definitely going to be military. And this will allow me to have better weapons, this will allow me to research better weapons and so on, just generally get everything powered up a bit further. So military science is made from piercing ammunition, which is nukes, it requires steel, also grenades and walls. So I've got all that built up here and now I just need to feed the inputs in. Then we have a nice long belt running up here and it might as well share a belt with the red science for now. So it's, 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 uh, there's plenty of room on it and that'll get it up to join the rest of the sciences up top. Here we go, the machine is, is working, and grey science packs coming out. Excellent. That means I can now start to research more powerful bullets, faster sh shooting speeds, better turrets, that sort of thing. And this should keep, and this should be a self, if I've done the numbers right, this should all work together in a nice, in the right ratios and produce about one, um, one science juice per machine second. And a machine second is a second times the speed of the machine, or divided by the speed of the machine. So given these machines are slightly slower than building in real time it produces slightly less than one science a second but it's a good it's a good starting point and it make and it means you can keep all of your if you design all of your science factories on that same sort of ratio then it means you know you've got the same amount of each one being produced it makes the numbers relatively easy and it means when you come to upgrade them you can just copy and paste and stick in another one of the same sort of thing so it makes it nice makes it nice and easy and it keeps everything ticking over smoothly i've researched electric mining drill 2 now which is basically the same as electric mining drill one except it runs a bit faster so you can produce ore much more quickly out of your mind and out of the ground uh, and that's i think is actually worth having so what i'm building up here is a factory that will build a set, uh, mining drills one and then turn those into mining drill two because drills are one of those satisfying things where 
making the Mark II version requires one of the Mark I versions, so you've got something to do with all of the old ones that you had left over. So as I go around the base and pick up all the old Mark I mining drills, I can feed them in here and then turn them into Mark IIs rather than having to throw them away. And we'll probably do a gradual upgrade as I as I feel like I'm short of something or I feel like the or as I build new mines out. And this is the point where I realise I've screwed up the um, the grey science production because I or the grey science transport extra transportation because I didn't bother le uh, because I put it on the same belt as the red, which then went up to the same belt as the yellow. There were too many things on the same belt. So here we go. I've uh, split off onto its own belt and and put that in on the other side. So that's now working nicely. And I've got a sniper turret being researched. I've also noticed that there's another way to produce um, to produce oxygen, and that's producing that's producing it from air and just splitting that into nitrogen and oxygen. Um, and this seems like it might potentially be a much better way to do it. So we're going to give it a shot, see how it compares. It does produce nitrogen as well, but that's okay. We can burn that off in a, with a flare stack. Okay, nitrogen doesn't burn, but you know what I mean. Feed that in with the rest of the oxygen supply and see how it goes. Now along here, I'm producing the copper so quickly that the um, factory isn't using it up fast enough to, to deal with it all. So what I'm, what I'm adding in here is uh, essentially it's a, a warehouse to act as a buffer. So I'll have all of these inserters grabbing the, uh, grabbing the copper that comes in from, from the mine, putting it in the warehouse to somewhere to store it. And there's masses of space in a warehouse and then feeding it out the other side. So it gives me a, a big buffer of a, so about 140,000 I think and that allows me to just build it up while the, while the mine's running and still have the, the iron coming out the other side to be turned into steel. And I can turn some more, <laughs> some more bricks into, into flooring and that'll allow me, to, as I said, to run around a bit quicker. And also it uses up a load of these um, resources that I don't have a, currently have a use for. And in hindsight, this might not have been the best thing to do, because later on I did discover that I needed them, but, you know, spoilers. Um, <laughs> but here I'm doing the same thing again with the bricks that I did with the, with the copper. So I've got it being fed in on one side of the warehouse and then fed out on the other side, so that I can have a plentiful... So I, I've got that big buffer going again, just in case I need it, and somewhere to store it. Because these are resources that I need to produce as a side effect of producing something else. So I need some way of not getting rid of them, but, well, yeah, literally getting rid of them and just putting them off somewhere else out of the way for the time being. I'm now upgrading the crushed stone disposal system to uh, to yellow belts all the way through, because, I'm, I'm, again, I'm still not using remotely enough of it. So it's just extending the same design as I had before. Because, as mentioned, yellow belts are twice as fast, and that doesn't just mean they get things there twice as quickly, it means you can fit twice as much throughput on them as well. And hopefully that'll be enough for my current mining situation. We'll give it a moment or two to calm down, and we'll see. Nope, it needs a bit more yellow belt putting in there to give me a bit more throughput. There we go, that should be a bit better. The Juvalite mine is producing a lot more than everywhere else. So it just needs, it just need, we just need to flood it all through and pass it, pass it into the into the assembly machines. And now we can upgrade the Juvalite mine to uh, Mark II drills. There we go. So that's now going to be producing the ore even faster. And hopefully it'll keep up with the steel production I've got going. Steel is always difficult to produce because it's quite expensive. In, in, in this it takes a lot of iron to make a relatively small amount of steel. Of course another thing you can do with stone is turn it into landfill. That'll get rid of quite a lot of it as well. So let's see how that goes. And now let's give a, uh, give those new sniper turrets a try as well. I've, I've developed them so I might as well find out whether they're any good. And the biters are still being quite difficult up here as you can see. So let's put in a bit of extra land that get, allows me to stretch the turrets out a bit further so the biters are coming up to a choke point. And the sniper turret on the back there will pick off the weaker ones as they come flooding in and soften them up a bit. And then we've got the old dragon's teeth, because that's always nice to have in it. It slows, them, it slows the biters down a bit, makes it harder for them to get to, the, get to your front line, and gives the turrets a bit more time to shoot them up a bit. Here they come. Ooh. Well, that seemed to work. The um, turrets are all, all survived, but they did get a bit, the biters did get a bit closer than I ideally want them to. So let's try a few more dragon's teeth. Turning this by hand is pretty laborious, but I don't have bots yet, so there's not much of a choice if I want to have them. And finally, let's up the bobmonium supply. Since I'm now getting through tin quite a lot quicker because I'm actually using it, I need a bit more. And there we go. That's coming now to the end of what I did in the first first ten episodes. We've just sped through those in a fraction of the time. I hope you found that interesting. Um, as I said at the beginning, I'm aware that Factorio is a game that is a bit slow at the start when you're all when you're doing all the building by hand and you have to having to mine by hand and that sort of thing. But now we've got up to the point where we've got we've got iron, got copper, we've got lead, got tin a couple of types of circuits, got wood and coal and so on and so on, all building up a nice big chunky bus. We've got three types of science all coming through. So this is the sort of point where the game's really starting to get going. 
And from here on, well, I hope you'll start off. I hope you'll carry on and uh, jump straight in with episode eleven and uh, carry on from there. I look forward to seeing seeing how you get uh, seeing you when you get when you get caught up. At the moment, we're on about thirty or so episodes. This might be higher by the time you see this, of course. But uh, yeah, as I say, I look forward to seeing seeing you then. If you have any comments on the video, if you think it was useful and uh, and a nice way to get an introduction to the channel, please let me know. I'm always interested in seeing your comments and and any suggestions you've got. Although that said, if the suggestions are about ways I should have built the factory differently, it might be a little bit late now. But uh, so yeah, please catch up and then let me know what you think of the uh, of the latest things I'm building. Until then, well, I'll see you later.